I came here to see if I could continue my life as a journalist <laughs> in this country. Again, so calm where I didn't speak the language. So how do you jump into another country when you don't know any of the main three languages, the only other person that you know is your new husband, and your job being a journalist depends on talking to other people? The short answer, you figure it out. So many <laughs> things that I learned and that I've done for the very first time in my life here in Switzerland, I, I can't begin to tell you. And had I just stayed, I would have stayed just being a news reporter and that's it, which is something that I already knew how to do. My guest this week is Ariane Alcorta. She's 28 years old, has a master's degree in journalism from Columbia University in New York. She's worked at Telemundo in Boston and then uprooted her life and moved to Switzerland with her husband. There, she wears many hats as a freelance journalist, a correspondent, a media trainer, and a college professor. She has a new perspective on international news coverage and also work-life balance. In any other country that I visited, it, that's the case. They always uh, you know, talk about the national news, but they make a huge chunk of space to talk about what's happening in the rest of the world. And that's what I think it's missing in the news in the US. The president met with congressional leaders. Doctors will start implanting the devices. And he heard that warning from the Coast Guard tonight. For now, we're live in Orlando. For now, we're live in Dallas. We're live in Boston tonight. Caitlin McCulley, 7 News 19. I'm Caitlin McCulley. I left my job as a TV news reporter in a pandemic to try to find a better way to share stories that matter. No BS. Thanks for listening to Outlet Podcast. You can download new episodes each week. Here is Ariane Alcorta. Tell me a little bit about your your journey in journalism. You've reported and anchored in tons of cities in the U.S. and now you're in Switzerland, right? How did this all come to be? Well, uh, very very easy actually. I I, I got married. <laughs> I mean, it, it's it's really it's the one thing that nowadays with this feminist movement, they tell you not to do. Oh yeah, never leave your career for a man. Why would you, et cetera. But in my case, it was just a challenge. You know, it was just a challenge that I was willing to accept. I was based in Boston, um, working as a TV news reporter in breaking news. It was a dream of a job. I loved it. Um, and then I decided to move to a country that was extremely calm that where I didn't speak, speak the language, any of the three official languages, I didn't speak <laughs> French, German, or Italian. And I came here to see if I could continue my life as a journalist <laughs> in this country, again, so calm where I didn't speak the language and, uh, married, you know, with a man whom I've never even lived with in the same city. So <laughs> that's how I came to Switzerland. <laughs> so, you were, so you were in Boston, you went to um, University of Miami, you went to Columbia Journalism School, and but you guys weren't living in the same city. Yeah, well, we met in Miami. And uh, three weeks later, I moved to New York. Uh, to do my master's at Columbia Journalism. And he stayed in Miami. And uh, when I graduated and I found a job in Boston, he found uh, he was transferred to Switzerland. So it seemed like destiny was trying to pull us apart. Um, so that's <laughs> how we went. It was a bit, a bit crazy in that sense. Well, you know, and that's one thing with, with TV journalism that I feel like some people don't understand who aren't in the business is that having a long distance relationship isn't necessarily that uncommon. Maybe Switzerland, Boston, Miami, like that far, far out is, is maybe a little more unusual, but you got to move where the jobs are and, and figure it out from there. As a TV journalist, the way that you grow is to move, right. Is to change from one market to the other, not necessarily staying in the same city. Um, so it's, uh, it's tough. It's tough. And for me, it was, uh, it was extremely tough. My family, uh, I lived in with my family in Miami, but then they moved to, um, to Spain for reason, for visa reasons. Um, they, they were all here because of my, the, the job of my mom and then she stopped working. So she had to leave. And then I was here because of the student visa. And then I got my job visa. So I managed to stay. 
Um, and uh, it was it was hard. I, I saw my family only once a year for a week. And uh, then and my boyfriend, who I was having this long distance relationship, we, we managed to see each other more often. Thanks. Thanks to the fact that he had to travel a lot to Miami, you know, back and forth. So he made sure to to make a stop in Boston or I would go in the weekends to Miami to escape the cold in Boston. And that's how <laughs> we sort of made it work. But it's tough, especially because in the U.S., um, it's one of the countries. And now that I have this uh, broad experience of knowing how other countries work, especially here in Europe. It's interesting because the U.S., it's one of the countries that don't have much of a work-life balance, especially in TV news. Mm -hmm. So you only have two weeks of vacation and that's it. And even then they make you feel guilty when you take them. Totally. So it, yeah, I can say it's it was very tough. It was very tough to have a one week I dedicated to visit my, my boyfriend, who is now my husband. And then the other week I dedicated it to, to my family, to visit my parents and my sister. So it was tough. It was tough. I, I actually, you know, moving to Switzerland, it was a whole different story here in, in Switzerland. You have five weeks of vacation and, uh, um, a lot of holidays and, and uh, you stopped working at 5 p.m. And if you overwork, actually the government can penalize the company if they find out. So they, really? they take it very seriously here, the work-life balance. And here, if you ha want a day off or if you're going on vacation, uh, nobody sees you in a wrong way. Quite the contrary, people see you in the wrong way when they see that you're too much involved <laughs> in your work. So here they, they really do respect that. And uh, that's kind of the cultural differences that I really found in, in, in work, uh, you know, in comparison to the U S where basically your whole life is your work. Right. Yeah. Were you expecting that to be so different? N no, not at all. Um, no, nope. <laughs> actually it came, it came a, a bit of a shock, but it, it came to my advantage, right? It, you know, and the fact that I, I, again, it's more of a work-life balance in here. And, and again, they don't see you badly if you, if you take some time off for yourself or your mental health, et cetera. And, uh, yeah, in, in the U S even though I loved my job and, and I got used to that mentality of always work, 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 work 14 hours a day even though I was paid for eight, right. <laughs> you know, it, it's also, also a passion, you know, being a, being a TV journalist. So I never really complained, but for my mental health and for life in general, it's just much better. Now I feel like I'm actually living or I actually have time for myself. Like my whole life is not my office, my, my work. Mm -hmm. Right there are two extremes, right? I think the U S is one extreme, but I think I, and I've seen countries here in Europe that it's like another extreme, like they mm -hmm. stop work completely at lunch. And if there's an emergency, no, I'm sorry. I'm at lunch. I'm not saying it's the case here in Switzerland, but I've seen it in other countries in, in Europe. So it's, uh, yeah. it's kind of interesting how things work in, in different cultures, depending on, on the culture. Right. Yeah. Well, you mentioned storytelling as a passion and that's what made you okay with working these long hours for so much of your career. What is it about storytelling that, that drew you to it? Well, it's the fact that you can make a change with storytelling. You can tell stories that make impact on other people. Um, when you do this interview and, uh, the interviewee expresses these emotions uh, of pain, of, of laugh, of anything. And, and, mm -hmm. and it, it can inspire you to change your life in a good way, or it can inspire you to take a change to correct something that has been a problem, right? So it, it's just that power of, of journalism, of storytelling that we have to, to make meaningful changes, right? In, in a good way, in, in the way that helps people. Was it different than you expected when you first got into the business? Was it different than I, than I expected it? Um, 
Yes, just a little bit, you know, and when I was in at Columbia, for instance, at Columbia Journalism, I was always taught to tell, again, the people stories, stories that inspire, make impact, etc. And then when I was in, in the newsroom, uh, in a 24 hour newsroom, with filled with breaking news and, and the stories of the day, um, we came into a place that, okay, what's going to make people watch the news today. And uh, sometimes it was not okay. The, the happy story that would inspire you, but the death and the blood and something that would make impact in that sense. Right. And, um, and I think that's, that's what impacted me. It, yeah. And in, in that sense, um, another thing that I can add, uh, maybe, as a Venezuelan, as an, and as an immigrant, I always wanted to tell these stories that happened in other countries. Mm -hmm. um, if there was a big story, I, I wanted to tell it. And, you know, always having this angle, the local angle, since I was working in a, in a local news story. And But sometimes it, it was hard. It was like, no, it has to be just, just in Boston. And people are not, really not going to care. So, I don't know. I think it's... Um, it depends, right? Because as a reporter, you can pitch your story, but at the end of the day, it's the the, the editors and producers who's, who are going to say yes to your story or not. And uh, most of the times, I mean, I had the luck that the, the people in my team always understood my point of view. But but since we worked with, uh, I, I worked in Telemundo, which was uh, the Spanish language uh, newscast, and and in, in Boston specifically. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we also worked with the English side, with NBC, et cetera. So, so sometimes I thought or I felt like there was a mix of cultures that wouldn't let me cover the stories I would like to cover. Like mm -hmm. they, they were not interested in some of the stories I pitched. For instance, the story about the stories about Venezuela. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very passionate about those, right? And whenever I wanted to pitch those. Um, they would say, oh, no, it, you know, the people here wouldn't care. And my argument would always be like, well, but why not educating people in Boston about what's happening out there or what's happening internationally? They have the right to know why would should we be only talking about the stories that happen here? Mm -hmm. And I think that's what I noticed as well in the whole industry in the U.S., and that's what I was trying to battle always. They always wanted to talk about what was happening in the U.S. And although it is true that many things happen in the U.S. because it's such a huge country, they very rarely talked about what, what happens abroad. Mm -hmm. And that plays against uh, just educating people in general about what's happening in the world. You would talk to people in the streets about what would happen in Europe and nobody, nobody knows because nobody in, in, in newscast in general, and even in national news, they don't really talk about it. Mm -hmm. So do you find that there's a different sensibility where you are, that there's much more of an interest in what's happening in other countries? Exactly. I think in any other country that I visited, it, that's the case. They always, uh, you know, talk about the national news, but they make a huge chunk of space to talk about what's happening in the rest of the world. And that's what I think it's missing in the news in the U.S. Why do you think that is? I have no idea. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> to be completely honest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would I would love to have an answer that that was my main battle when when I was in, in local news stations in in the US. Um, but of course, my battle was stronger because I was in a local news business. So they wanted me to talk locally. Sure. And uh, if anything big happens, okay, we can talk of some issues that happen na nationwide. But I saw it also in, in nation in, in national newscasts and the networks that you wouldn't see them making a space or much of a space to talk about something abroad unless there was a huge bomb that exploded or unless it's Syria, Syria related or Iraq. And that's only because the U.S. is involved. Mm -hmm. So very U.S. centric. Exactly. It's not only me who says it. It's also the international community. Whenever I talk to people, oh, yeah, but why? Why the people in the U.S.? 
you know, they, they seem like they don't know what's happening in, in other countries. So, I mean, when you try to talk to them about this issue or that other issue, they don't know. And I personally believe it's because of that, because uh, we, the journalists, we have this power of educating the people in our countries about what's, what's happening. And, and if we don't put that in our newscast, then how can we pretend other people to find out? Mm -hmm. Right. That's our job. Totally. That is our job. And I think there are a lot of journalists who probably feel that way and feel in the U.S. and feel kind of trapped within their organizations, um, similar to you, that they would like to be covering these things. But the business model as it's set up in the U.S. doesn't lend itself to that, because if it's based on attention and they've done all this research on what holds their audience's attention, you know, they're really not incentivized to to do work that educates or, or is um, maybe not going to keep people watching immediately. Or um, I think it has to do with the business model in the U S that keeps, um, keeps that kind of content off, off the air. So when you move to Switzerland, are you finding now that you have much more freedom in what you're covering? Yes. Well, I'm also a freelance journalist, so I can't say I, I can speak I can't compare apples to apples is what I'm trying to say sure. because I'm not working in a local news organization here in Switzerland. Um, but I, I do notice that, that there's, yeah, there, there's the topics here are more broad. They do touch on the subjects and what's happening in the whole Europe. Uh, and they talk even about what's happening in Latin America or in Africa. And obviously they mentioned the U S such an important country. Um, but there's variety, you know, you watch newscasts in here and uh, if you understand it because it's in French, German or Italian, like I said before, yeah. <laughs> you can tell that there's a variety of topics around the world that they touch. And, and, and when I traveled to Spain to visit my parents, same story, you, you watch a newscast there a full hour and you find out about what's happening in the world. They, they talk about Venezuela. They talk about what's happening in China. Let's talk about what's happening in Africa, uh, whatever. But you have a more, a broader sense of what's happening in the world is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. So you speak three languages, which languages do you speak? English, obviously Spanish, <laughs> Spanish, <laughs> English, and French. Okay. And so you moved to Switzerland and you found out that None of those were super helpful. Well, I learned French when I moved. <laughs> so <Okay. laughs> when I moved here, I didn't know how to how to speak French. And even then, um, I, it's not like I'm completely fluent. I'm 100% fluent in English and Spanish, but in French, um, I get by. And uh, I could be able to do a story in, in French, but it's not like I'm... Like I'm, it's my mother tongue. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. Right. Had I've not been to Europe in many years, but I remember the last time that I was there and I embarrassingly only spoke English. I spoke a little bit of Spanish, but not really. It made you feel really dumb because you're like, wow, this is not normal to only speak one language. Like it's really kind of arrogant of us and um, ignorant. And it, and it felt like everyone that I met was, was fluent in at least two, if not three languages. Yeah, it is, it is true that here everybody speaks uh, different languages. And if you come to Switzerland, it's very common that you find people who, who speak at least five languages. Oh so I actually felt really dumb just speaking two languages <laughs> when I arrived because you would find the, per the person who speaks English, French, German, Italian, oh, Portuguese as well. So it's... Wow. wow. <laughs> it's common in here. <laughs> <laughs> Did you find that people were just taught many languages from an early age or they've just kind of picked them up as they've grown up? I think it's probably both. Yes. Yeah. Uh, in, I've, as I understand, at, he, at least here in Switzerland, you are, well, in, in my region, obviously you learn how to speak French, but in school you are obliged to, to, to learn um either Italian or German, which, which are the two other languages in, um, in Switzerland. And of course, English. Okay. And English has obviously come in handy for you. You said you were doing some, some hosting opportunities in the age of pandemics. Yes, yes, uh, definitely. And here, okay, yes, obviously there are many people who speak English, but they, companies like to seek hosts that know how to speak completely fluent English with no accent 
or at least with an accent of a particular uh, country where they speak English, you know, of an accent of right. the UK or American or Scottish, et cetera. Um, so it, it, it came very handy because, because of the pandemic, all the panels turned virtual and uh, they could move and <laughs> they, they needed to, they needed moderators. They needed hosts who would speak perfect English, uh, so that the, the, the guests, coming from all over the world and this in these uh, virtual panels could understand. Mm -hmm. So I've had the luck that I've uh, been able to to work with uh, the Geneva Health Forum, which is, uh, well, the one of the biggest global forums about health. And this year or last year, actually, 2020 was the year of the pandemic. So <laughs> what a better or what a more important uh, uh time to, to, to speak about the health crisis that, that mm -hmm. the world is having. So that's one. And for instance, next month, I'm going to be doing a series of panels with Credit Suisse, which is one of the, I don't know if it's the biggest or the second biggest, but definitely amongst the biggest um, banks here in Switzerland. So it's, it's been great because it's working with multinational organizations, with huge banks, uh, international organizations, um, with the UN as well. So yeah, it's just now the future is uh, virtual panels, also media trainings. <laughs> now everybody wants to know how to be on camera because of the consequences of the pandemic. So th those are other jobs that, that have come to me as well. <laughs> okay. And so you're kind of doing a little bit of everything. You're, you're doing these panels, you're doing training, you're still doing storytelling. You're still doing um, doing reporting for for various networks. What have you been most proud to cover recently, or what has been most interesting? Most recently, I haven't done many stories, uh, like video stories, but I think the last one that was very fun to do, I would say, would be the flying the first ever electric plane in the world. Wow. <laughs> it flew in Switzerland for the very first time. And I was among the, the first to actually fly it. And uh, it was good. They, they took me to fly it. And, and I was shooting the whole story as a one woman band. And it came out quite, quite great. <laughs> so you, I have not seen this video and I'll, I'll go look it up for sure. What did it's it on play, YouTube. <laughs> what did this plane look like? How big was it? And what was the experience like? Well, it's um, it's a very small plane. It's actually a Swedish company, but for some reason, the the first prototype for the or the first plane um, flew in Switzerland and, and it became the first certified electric plane in uh, in the world. And it's uh, it's a very small one. It's only a two seater plane. It's meant for training, so it's meant for to teach you, for instance, how to fly a plane. So it's a very small, very light plane. But the same company is planning to uh, release a four seater very soon. I think uh, by the end of this year or or in twenty twenty two. So it's expanding. <laughs> but it was it was quite nice. They, they charge the plane like like a mobile phone, basically. It <laughs> wow, cool. So where did you fly in that? Just kind of a uh, very. Yeah, well, it's in the center of Switzerland. It's uh, very close to where I live, like about 30 minutes. So it's it's a place where, again, they have m many different airplanes and they use it to to train other pilots. And uh, so I just went and, and flew it. Well, I, I didn't fly it. I was a passenger. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. um, and I know you, you mentioned also, and this was pre-pandemic, I'm assuming, where you... you went to Rome to cover, um, to cover a story related to the Pope? Yes, yes. I, I cover co a couple of stories as an international correspondent for Telemundo that year when I moved. So I, I went twice in, in a couple of vacations. And uh, at first I went to for the canonization of a Salvadoran saint who became the first uh, saint, I believe, in Latin America, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. It was a big event. Thousands of people around Latin America, just to, to watch that, um, that moment. And I, I was able to interview an exclusive, the family of, of that saint. Um, and it was, it was amazing. Uh, I went completely alone, as I told you before, completely as a one woman band. 
And then I, I went in another occasion uh, four months later to cover the sexual abuse scandals. The It was the first time that the Pope and the church really admitted that there was a problem. And it was the first time that the Pope was meeting um, to, to discuss about it. So yeah. it was, uh, it was a several day meeting and, uh, advocates and victims flew from around the world to, you know, put pressure on, on, on those meetings. So it was, it was quite emotive. And I, I was able to, to interview many people from Boston, really victims that, that flew all the way from Boston. Wow. Um, and from Spain as well, people who were featured in Netflix documentaries in Spain came and, and uh, yeah, it was interesting to follow their journey in there. Mm-hmm. And so it sounds like you're doing, you're doing a lot. I know you're probably working le- fewer hours, or would you say you're, you're still working a lot? Um, I have my freedom. Let's, <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's say that way. Um, I like, I, I wear different hats, but that doesn't mean that I'm wearing those hats at the same time all the time. Right. So I can be a correspondent once this month, but I don't have to be, or, you know, if, if the time doesn't allow it, I, there, there, it's been months that I, that I don't do it. But in the meantime, I do media trainings or I do moderations with panels. So it depends on the opportunity that it presents. I'm also a, a university professor. So every Thursday, so every Thursday, you know, I'm the professor. So it's, it's, it, it, it depends. I also work with a, a company that does videos for um, corporate videos for, for companies. So I'm, I'm a, kind of a senior producer in there and I'm also a media trainer for them. So it depends. It's, it's fun because it's similar to also to, to being a, a news reporter in a local news that you don't know what's going to happen the day, <laughs> the day after or the following week, et cetera. So it's, it's similar in that way that wow. it, it depends on the projects that they, that I have presented. Truly multimedia and multilingual storyteller. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. You're correct. Do you regret moving to Switzerland? No, not at all. Not at all. It has been such an amazing uh, experience filled with growth. I think had I not moved to Switzerland, I would have stayed in a very similar position that I had been um, before. And uh, now, like I said, I, I, I think when I moved to Switzerland or or thanks to the fact that I moved, it allowed me the opportunity to, to try things for the very first time. You know, I became a professor. That's the first, not this, something that I've never imagined. I became a media trainer, something that I thought I was going to be at 50 years old, not at 28, you know, (laughs) Um, a panel moderator of huge events that I, again, I wouldn't have had that chance in in the U.S. I became an anchor of, I don't know if we've talked about this because, but I became an anchor of CNN Money Switzerland here in, in Switzerland. So amazing stories that I, you know, that I, that I, that I was able to do in there, um, and amazing opportunities because also in the U S I was only doing things in Spanish. Very rarely would I do something in English. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, here I became a full-time or fully English speaking journalist. So that was also a, a big thing. Uh, I did several certificates, certificate in international relations in the London School of Economics and Economy and certificate in digital marketing. So again, I've I learned French, so many <laughs> things that I learned and that I've done for the very first time in my life here in Switzerland, I, I can't begin to tell you. And had I just stayed, I would have stayed just being a news reporter and that's it, which is something that I already knew how to do. Yeah. So <laughs> career advice, move to Switzerland. <laughs> For your advice, don't be afraid to sail on deep water. Just don't be afraid to, sh- to, to get away from the shore and try new things. And don't listen to other people when they tell you that they're concerned or worried or think that you're going to fail. That's quite of what happened to me when I, when I told people uh, who didn't know me as good because my, my, my good friends who knew my, my career and all that, they were like, oh, yeah 
you're going to succeed, whatever you do, whatever. But the people who didn't know me as much, they were like, oh, so you're not going to be a journalist anymore. And I'm like, well, if moving doesn't mean that I stop being a journalist, why, why would you say that? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so, um, or, or they would think, oh, so what are you going to do in there? Would, are you going to live in the mountain and that's it? <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's like, no, I mean, yeah, it was, it was very hard. The first year was extremely hard and I'm not going to lie. And everybody who, who maybe comes up with a similar situation that they have to abandon everything mm -hmm. and move to a different country where they don't even speak the language. The first year is very hard. You know, you find yourself with an identity crisis that you sort of don't know who you are anymore, right? You stop doing what, what you loved. Um, you jumped from a very, very hectic life to a calmed life. Now you're married with a man that you've never lived before with before. So it's a huge load of change that, you know, it, it's, uh, it's, a, you know, it, it takes on your mental health. So, um, uh, what I'm trying to say here is that, yeah, it's, it's hard, but it doesn't mean it's impossible. You just have to work hard. I, I never stayed still one minute. I came here, learned French, uh, did my own stories, uh, applied to 10,000 different jobs. I knew CNN Money Switzerland was here and I applied like 10 different times. I, I got 100 rejections. <laughs> <laughs> But still, what did I do? Oh, yeah, well, they talk about business. Maybe it's because maybe they're not selecting me because I don't have the right background. Okay, I'm going to do a certificate in business. You know, I, I pushed and pushed and pushed. And uh, at the same time, I was, uh, again, an, an international correspondent. So until I got it, until I got accepted, until they called me. And that's how, and, and in CNN Money, it was when I got the opportunity, aside from being an anchor, to be a media trainer. And that's where I, I was doing it for the first time. And inside there, one of the people I worked with told me, hey, so would you want to replace me to be a, a teacher, a professor at the university? Okay. Well, you know, I, I start accepting this role. <laughs> yeah. But again, the, the kind of like a domino effect. Yeah, exactly. 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 You get one thing and the rest comes easier. But, uh, you know, bottom line in the teaching lesson is don't be afraid uh, to sail away of the shore, okay, and, uh, and, and, and to accept change and, and to adapt because at the end of the day, when you manage to do it or, or when everything works out, it's just so worth it.